Okay guys, so today I wanted to talk about sort of an interesting subject for me, just a fun subject that I enjoy talking about, which is uh, immersive sims. My channel is largely, or at least the goal of my channel, uh, is largely to not only play through as many immersive sims as possible and give retrospectives and reviews on them, uh, but also to kind of explore the genre, if you want to call it that. It's more like a family of video games than a genre. And... Uh, one of the things that I'd like to do at some point is really sort of define what an immersive sim is. And I know it, it's sort of counterintuitive to be coming out with uh, this video before I really define what an immersive sim is. But today we're just going to be going through what I consider to be a really great sort of uh, compendium that lists basically all the immersive sims or many of the mainline immersive sims uh, out there on the market. And the reason I really like this list is it has kind of used the definition and expanded some of our understandings of how uh, mechanistically immersive sims play and feel to include more games than just, you know, Thief System Shock, uh, Ultima Underworld Deus Ex, and then some of the arcane games. You know, it it is a list that I find a lot more comprehensive and... Because there are many more games out there that seem to fit the design principles, the design philosophy, and many of these sort of hallmarks of what an immersive sim is. This is a list by, uh, on this site called Giant Bomb. It seems to be some sort of gaming site. I'm not super familiar with it, uh, but I found it when I was doing research you know, on immersive sims a while ago. And I have personally found it to be one of the most comprehensive lists that outlines all the different games that can definitely fall into the family or category immersive sims. So I just want to sort of go through the list today. It's so basically this is just sort of a sort of synopsis or summary of the game, its general mechanics, plot, things like that. So we're going to go through the list today. I'm going to, I'll include the link in the description of course. And um, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on maybe other games that didn't make it onto this list or that weren't discussed on this list. And, uh, you know, sort of what immersive sims are to you. What do you think defines them? Um, just to preface, so I don't want to get into the topic of defining immersive sims today because that is it. <laughs> that is a, a uh, definitely a topic for another time. It deserves its own video. And... It is a point of some contention among a lot of different gamers who are fans of the genre. In fact, even the people who coined the term immersive sim and use it, even they admit it's kind of a terrible term. Um, it is just sort of stuck, and it's now what these family of games or category of games are sort of called. But for me, it's, it's really in the title. A lot of people seem to think that immersive sims are really about... Uh, well, you need to put the player in a game world and give them a lot of obstacles and give them many different ways to uh, solve those problems or get around those obstacles. And I don't think that's really the design philosophy. There are definitely certain companies, I think Arcane definitely designs this way, who, who design with that in mind. That's at the forefront of their design philosophy. It's not necessarily a bad thing either. But I think the core of immersive sim design philosophy is it came from looking glass studios was really that the reason that you're able to solve problems in so many different ways is not because the programmer sat down and said we want you know nine ways to get around this door or nine ways to get around this booby trap and we need to make sure that you know it's play tested to death to make sure you can do it all no what they did was it's really in the title they created a simulation and just as in life you know you can always think outside the box or be clever, or um, try something that you'd never try be tried before to get around a particular problem, just as you can do that in reality, in a simulation of reality, the same rules that apply to our reality. And then, of course, if there's magic in the simulated reality and things like that, you can start applying even more rules. But basically, once you have an understanding of those rules, you should be able to apply them in any different way you want. Not only does this allow you to problem solve with a large degree of creativity um, and inventiveness, but it also lets you play the game how you want, and it, it can further deepen your role-playing experience as the player character in that game because you feel totally invested in a world that feels real 
and is a sort of simulation of some kind of reality. And so, and if you look at Looking Glass's design philosophy, like their control setups and things like that, a lot of people have said that early Looking Glass games control and, you know, how the keyboard is mapped out is a lot more like a flight simulator. So I think they took the ideas of simulation games, right, and applied them to something other than flight or driving or something like that. Like, we want this to be as real as possible with as many as many rules that can be intuited based on your experience with your own reality or as many rules that can be figured out based on your experience with the game as it progresses. And so that's where it's like, okay, we want it to be a simulation, but we want it to be immersive. We want you to feel like a player in a world, not just like some sort of person stuck in a cockpit and you can't go anywhere else wants you to feel immersed in an entire world and I think that's really where the sort of term immersive sim came from and it I think it fits sort of the broader spectrum of these games a lot better that we're about to discuss so let's get into it um, I'm gonna start from the oldest entries on the list and I'm going to skip a few so there's a couple at the beginning here there's one called uh, Hokkaido Renzu uh, Setsujin um, these are adventure games, early adventure games developed for uh, early computer systems in Japan. And I think the reason they're on here is they were really open-ended story games where you had a large degree of control over um, the narrative, over solving different puzzles, over things like that. Um, for example, uh, one of Hideo Kojima's first games is on here called Snatcher, which is a sort of cyberpunk ripoff of Blade Runner. And I think one of the reasons it's on here is because, again, you know, you have a large degree of control over where the story goes and how you solve problems and what you can do and interact with. I'm not going to include them because, A, I don't have a lot of experience with them, and B, for this list, I'm going to try and keep it to games that are in a first-person perspective. That's something else that you could argue about. Well, can you have immersive sims that are not in the first-person perspective? I think you can, but... Due to my lack of experience with any of these games and the fact that um, they are not sort of in keeping with sort of the early immersive design principles, I'm not going to put them. I am going to make one sort of honorable mention here uh, that they put the original Legend of Zelda there because I think, again, it was a game that was trying to drop you into a world, not tell you where to go, not give you a ton of directions, and give you a lot of tools to play with. To just say like, okay, make the story your own, get immersed, get get into the you know role play and see if you can figure it out. So I think that's a, probably a good inclusion, but maybe not up to the strictest definitions there. So of course, first game on the list would be Ultima Underworld. Now, I recently just finished a playthrough of Ultima Underworld. Uh, it has recently been, well not recently, but it has been ported into Unity and it's continually being worked on. Um, if anyone wants any information, just let me know in the comments. I'd be happy to give you more information about Underworld uh, in Unity. I would say it's my almost preferred method of playing the game. The problem with the Unity port is it's extremely buggy and not just like, oh, sometimes, you know, I can't pick up objects the way I want to. Like, it doesn't happen. No, no, no. They're pretty serious bugs, you know. Massive save corruption, not even being able to load saves, not even being able to finish certain story quests because certain elements in the game world don't work the way they're supposed to. Puzzles that literally just the solution will not open doors, things like that. So there's a caveat to if you want to play uh, the Unity version. But I gotta say, um, seeing early gameplay footage of this game, it just... I couldn't get you can't really get a sense of what the game has to offer until you sit down and play it but it is an amazing experience and it really showcases the early concepts of the design philosophy of an immersive sim and it was one of the first games to just it was probably the first game to just put you in a first person perspective make the world have a lot of real rules that made sense um, the context of our reality and say okay just go so for example there's uh, a a physics engine in the game the player is a physics entity with inertia so when you let go of the w key you will still move a little bit especially if you were kind of booking it um, your jump distance is not a pre-prescribed distance um, in the game like in something like tomb raider where everything is grid based so she will always jump the same distance forward no matter what um, given certain constraints no, you can jump not as far as you want, but, you know, 
basically your jump distance is governed by your current speed or your maximum speed. So, and it, there is a large gradient in between um, because it's all calculated based on the physics of the player in the environment. You can throw objects, they will drop. There is simulated gravity in the world. Um, things like this. And um, in addition to that, uh, there's lots of other simulation in the game, like, you know, the ability to, uh, well, there's lighting. So this was one of the first games to have, like, real simulated lighting. So you can light torches, and it will change the local illumination in the environment. Um, and then there's all sorts of other sort of uh, immersive aspects, like being able to combine things like fire and food to cook the food. Uh, you have to eat. You have to sleep. Um, if you want to open a door, for example, you could find a key or you could just break it down by just beating it to death with your sword or with your fists or whatever. Um, and uh, this was one of the first, well, I mean, in, in a first person perspective like this, where you had to like worry about, uh, you know, equipping your character with armor and stuff like that. And there was weapon degradation and armor degradation, and you could learn a repair skill or take it to take your armor to a smith to get it repaired. Uh, you could have conversations with NPCs and they would have like their own, not really cycles, but they would have their own things that they were doing. They would have pathing and stuff like that to walk around the world and they did their own thing. So at the time, this was one of the most real feeling games. Um, there was even things like climbing walls and swimming and, and things like that that just had never even been heard of before because keep in mind, um, Wolfenstein 3D came out after this game, and Wolfenstein 3D and Doom are both not three-dimensional games. They're called, uh, I forget what it's called, ray-casting games that give you the impression of a three-dimensional image while actually operating on two-dimensional principles. So that's why you don't have to aim in the original build of Doom except for uh, uh, left and right. So you don't have to aim up and down. You have one-dimensional aiming, and that's because it's it, it's a two-dimensional environment. So you don't have to worry about aiming up and down. Um, as long as the enemy is in front of you, regardless of your crosshairs on them, you should be able to hit them. Um, and of course, this game had actual 3D with texture-mapped environments. There are different levels. You can go. Uh, under something you can go above something you can go there's ramps there are all sorts of different things there's even a puzzle that manipulates the ground uh in different ways so you can actually create you can actually constantly change the uh geometry of the ground in this one part of the level and the cool thing is it even applies to the level of the dungeon below it uh, so this was all basically unheard of at the time and when you play the game It's just dizzying how much stuff there is in the game You can control how you swing your weapon if you want to swing it overhand if you want to slash with it If you want to bludgeon with it if you want to stab with it um, You can actually fly in the game. There is a ring that allows you to levitate. There's a spell you can cast to levitate you can walk on water, so typically you have to swim in the water, which again, that's a lot of depth for the game, literally and figuratively. Um, but then you can get a spell to walk on water, and then you can basically uh, start platforming through a lot of the water. In, in fact, there's one um, of the items that you have to get in the game that's easiest to get if you walk on water and then and use the sort of river leading up to it as a ramp. Um, and there's an incredibly complex set of level design for, once again, a game of this time. I mean, you play something like Wolfenstein 3D that's just not very... I mean, it's complex in a sort of two-dimensional way, very maze-like, but it's not... I mean, it's all, you know, the gray floors, gray ceilings, blue walls pretty much throughout the entire game, whereas this game had so much going on, you know, really complex, you know, sort of simulations of mountains and strange caves and things like that, and... Um, going underneath obstacle I mean it just it was you know it was amazing for the time and I was really blown away by everything that you can do in the game so Ultima Underworld really was the first game to just really try and simulate an environment as best as possible like I said with physics with um, things like swimming with uh, all of these elements to make the game world feel completely real and have the player just get lost in it and also have the player just say like okay what can I do 
to get around this. I'll give you a great example. There's uh, one door in the game where you go up to this portcullis and every other time you've been to uh, gates in the game, there's usually someone behind it who will tell you how to, who will open it for you if you ask them. And there's a tower you have to get into. And the game just says, okay, figure it out. So one of the things you could do is you could use the spell um, to open doors, uh, use that spell, and that will open the portcullis, open the lock. Um, or if you look below, there is a lake. Again, I mean, this level of complexity and detail, there is a lake below the drawbridge over the tower that you can drop down into and swim around the back. And if you swim around the back, there's a beach on the other side of this little lake and you can actually see there is an open balcony at the back of the tower. So if you have the levitate spell, you can actually levitate up there. Or since you probably don't have the runes to do the levitate spell or the casting um, level at that point in the game because it's pretty early, you can trade with um, some local dwarves for a levitation potion. And you can levitate up there and get in that way. Or there is a prisoner that you meet at the beginning of the game who tells you he escaped from prisoner by... Uh, taking a wooden pole and sticking it through the portcullis and flipping the switch and then running out that way. And guess what? You can do the same thing. You can take a wooden pole from your inventory, use it on the gate, or actually use it on the switch, and your character will stick the pole through the gate and flip the switch. So, again, I don't think they designed the game like, oh, we want them to be able to have like a million ways to get in here. They just tried to simulate things as best as possible. And then when they realize, hmm, because of all these systems that we have, there are a lot of ways we could get in this tower if we changed the design of the level slightly. So it was really the progenitor to all immersive sims, and it was the progenitor to so many games. I mean, this is where the Elder Scrolls came up from. If you actually look at playthroughs of the original Elder Scrolls 1 Arena, it was clearly fanboys who were half paying homage and half ripping off Ultima Underworld because they loved the game so much and they're like, hey, we want to make a game just like it, but also sort of ripping it off. Um, in playing through Daggerfall, I, I just started Daggerfall in Unity. Uh, it, it feels very much like, I mean, basically any major RPG from the time that switched from sort of the, um, I believe Wizardry was the one where it is sort of first person and you do approach the dungeons in a first person way, but it's it's all sort of turn-based, you know what I mean? It, you're not actually exploring a real 3D environment, like you can turn left, you can turn right, and then you're basically playing the game frame by frame, and you make decisions at each frame. Um, and this was the first game to do something not like that, and so every, every other RPG that was first person and sort of like tried to create a real 3D space after this was just uh, ripping this game off because it may not have been super commercially successful, although it wasn't not commercially successful, but it was incredibly influential. And games having a real sort of world where you had to do things like swim and climb and eat and sleep and stuff like that, games having, you know, an RPG world set in a first person, uh, sort of real time first person simulated environment that of course have become things like I said, like Elder, you know, this is where eventually we get Skyrim and things like that all came from this game. So it's an incredibly influential um, immersive sim and of course the first on the list. Uh, I haven't actually finished, I started on Ultima Underworld 2. I have not decided if I want to try and play the original game with a mouse look mod or if I want to wait a little bit. Currently the Unity port of Underworld 2 does not have Currently, the Unity version of Underworld 2 does not have support for even saving the game. So, and as the, I mean, I, I thought the Unity port for Underworld 1 was almost too buggy to play, but he has even, the, the, the modder has even said, you know, Underworld 2 is really buggy. Underworld 1 is playable, but 2 is too buggy, and you can't even save. So I'm wondering if I'm going to wait for him to add saves to the game and try it that way, or if I'm going to try and put up with the controls. It does have improved controls over uh, Underworld 1, but I haven't decided yet, so I don't really know that much about the game, but it's essentially from what most people have said. It is a sequel. It adds a few new elements, but nothing really of note. It is sort of, once again, just another iterate, or, you know, sort of a by-the-number sequel of Underworld 1. It doesn't make it bad. It has all the same things and features that you would love about the original game. Um, just new levels, new locations, and a new story, and some new features. Next up on the list, we have uh, Elder Scrolls Arena. And this is the first Elder Scrolls game in the series. 
Um, what's interesting about Arena, especially as we just discussed Underworld Ascendant, is that Arena apparently started its life cycle as, I mean, it's called Arena for a reason, and if you've played Oblivion, you know what the Arena is. It's a gladiatorial arena. Um, it might have been multiplayer, it might have been single player, but it was, it was supposed to be some sort of gladiatorial um, fantasy-themed game. And apparently from uh, interviews with the developers um, of the Elder Scrolls series, apparently uh, after playing Underworld Ascendant, I believe while they were developing Arena, they kept adding, they, they loved Underworld Ascendant, or excuse me, not Underworld Ascendant, they loved Ultima Underworld. They played Ultima Underworld so much and they were so in love with the systems in that game and the the way it played and everything like that, that they they kind of started um, tweaking Arena. And it reminds me of, I, I had started a business one time with a friend and we had started making one particular product when we really wanted to be do something, doing something else, but we were like, well, that's probably a better product for down the road. It's gonna be harder to do, harder to launch. And we've just realized that we just had no passion for the original thing anymore. It might've made decent money, but it wasn't what we were passionate about. So eventually we just switched gears and started making the thing we wanted to make, and we got a lot further. Um, and uh, this was exactly the same thing, where once they realized, holy crap, we don't really care anymore about this gladiatorial game, uh, they just started you know, basically trying to make their own version of Ultima Underworld. And I think in some ways, in terms of some of the immersive aspects and the details that were in something like uh, Ultima Underworld, you know, they didn't quite uh, get to that uh, level. But what they did do that uh, Ultima Underworld failed to do was actually take um, the idea of the other Underworld as this large, you know, sort of open world space that's that's completely connected and they said okay well what if it's not inside a volcano anymore and so um in arena it is possibly the first 3d open world game ever and the other cool thing about arena is in most elder scrolls games you can only explore one province of tamriel or excuse excuse me one um yeah province or country of tamriel uh, you know, in Oblivion, it's um, Cyrodiil, which is like the central pro central province in Daggerfall. I think it's... I'm forgetting. Um, it might be called Daggerfall. I don't think it is, though. Um, in uh, Skyrim, obviously, it's Skyrim. In Morrowind, um, obviously, it's Morrowind. Um, uh, but in, in Arena, you could actually explore all of Tamriel. And there was this huge, large open world for you to explore with towns and cities and villages and so it kind of in some ways cranked what uh, Ultima Underworld did up to 11 to some degree um, and as we know you know that spawned the entire Elder Scrolls franchise which is a uh, you know not only hugely popular and and is one of the things I think that has sort of pushed RPGs into the mainstream and and made it more uh, popular amongst everybody and, and rather than just, you know, sort of uh, fringe segments of people. Um, the Elder Scrolls is definitely responsible for that. Um, and it's it has been heavily influential on, you know, the gaming industry from here on out. And um, this is largely due in part, again, or, or m majorly due uh, to the success and the influence of Ultima Underworld. So, Elder Scrolls Arena, I haven't personally had a chance to play, but it, it plays, it has a very similar control scheme to um, Ultima Underworld. There is, of course, dungeon crawling and exploration, but there's also the open world component. And uh, some of the feature list in Ultima Underworld is reduced. You know, I don't know if there's the same level of... Um, interactivity with different items in the world and and you know things like cooking food and and you know creating um uh tools to help you solve puzzles and things like that but it it was an attempt to once again create a sort of living breathing world as best as they could and so i think it's a fair um inclusion on this list in terms of immersive sims I, you know because they we're definitely trying to make their own version of Ultima Underworld and just expand upon it. The idea, um, I definitely think it's it's um, 
very much built upon the the sort of principles of immersive sims and, and you know namely uh the principles of creating a believable space that is you know as as real of a one-to-one -one depiction of of the world that the creators are trying to create as possible and allow the character to get lost and immersed in it you know and of course it is it is complete with things like uh, sleeping and eating in towns and and um, going to inns and um, I think you can even buy property in the game and stuff like that so this was the start of what we now know as sort of open world RPGs um, and of course as I said before directly influenced by uh, Ultima Underworld so and as I said too, graphically and, and at least in terms of controls and stuff like that, it is it's a very similar playing game to Ultima Underworld. In fact, even the um, combat mechanics they they're slightly uh, different, but it's it's the same sort of spirit in that you kind of control how your character swings their weapon, which is something that I think is great. And we really haven't seen done again recently in the modern era, except in games like. Um, I guess Mountain Blade has has these kind of mechanics, and of course, uh, Kingdom Come Deliverance as well had uh, those kind of mechanics, but those largely went away, and, and you know, RPG play kind of devolved into just hacking and slashing. So um, it's very nice to uh, see this in a game, and it, it is, you know, it does sort of highlight the fact that back in the day when, when people were pioneering these games, you know, uh, like Bethesda and Looking Glass and all of these people were pioneering what has now become sort of modern standard game design, um, they had a lot more innovative ideas, a lot more inventive ideas, you know. They wanted you to feel as though you were swinging the sword, so instead of just clicking a button once and watching your character do it, you would direct where the sword goes and sword slashes and things like that, so um, I kind of miss that we're, 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 we've left a lot of this behind and, and hopefully things like VR will bring it back, you know. If you've seen uh, playthroughs of Half-Life Alex, you've seen that a lot of these kind of inventive things are, are becoming more practical and, and more doable now because of the increase in technology. So, anyways, moving on. Next up we have System Shock. System Shock was, as some people have put it, sort of Ultima Underworld in space. I would say that System Shock has sort of trimmed a lot of the fat to make a much more intense experience. It has different design principles. It Largely System Shock 1 is still about dropping you into a world, giving you a lot of tools, and telling you, okay, these are your general objectives, figure it out however you will. Um, System Shock 1 is an absolutely excellent game and it has got a totally different tone whereas there is a lot of sort of wonder and fun adventure to something like Ultima Underworld System Shock 1 is really more in the territory of sort of survival horror uh, one of the ways they accomplish this for example in uh, Ultima Underworld you do feel a sense of progression and like you are becoming more powerful and sort of conquering the underworld because as you kill enemies they don't really respawn so uh, you will have to backtrack through different floors of the underworld uh, at many points and all of the enemies that you have previously killed will be dead making them safe to traverse uh, if you need to just go there for quest missions or to pick up items or to sell things. So uh, in System Shock however they constantly there is a system where if the enemies in the level fall below a certain number they will spawn in uh, X number more. And so you can never actually clear any of the levels in the game, but most of the resources in the game are somewhat finite, and this gives the game a feeling of absolute tension. It's a tension that never really lets up, because you know that the longer you take playing the game, the more that your resources are dwindling, and the enemies will never stop coming. It also makes the game uh, quite difficult. Um, Ultima Underworld introduced the idea of the Silver Sapling. It's basically a quick respawn point without having to load a save. And it can be somewhat redundant if you're just using saves a lot. Uh, but System Shock introduces a really great feature. You can, once again, save wherever you want. But because your resources are so limited, and things like healing items or even energy for uh, your cyber modifications and your weapons, um, is a little bit hard to come by, you sometimes have to sort of strategically use uh, 
these healing booths. If anyone has played Bioshock, it's similar to the Vita Chambers. Essentially, it's a way for you to respawn, come back with a little bit of health and a little bit of energy to sort of, you know, rush at the problem again. You know, if there's a bunch of enemies down the corridor, you're just like, I just don't have the ammo to deal with them, so I'm going to try hitting them with my pipe because um, it, it won't expend any ammo. And there's the Cyborg Reclamation Chamber, um, the healing booth, essentially, that I converted right next to me so I can use that to uh, respawn, get a little bit of health back, get a little bit of energy to try and get through this next section. So the game has this constant feeling of tension of managing resources and things like that. Um, additionally, these cyborg reclamation chambers do up the ante for the levels. Levels can be very intense as your resources are dwindling without the ability to respawn and regain some health because uh, they are not operational until firstly you find them and secondly you uh, turn them on. So this allows you to not really breeze through the level but kind of you know take it a little bit easier. But the game is very tense when you first come to a level and you can't find them. And I think there's even one level of the game where they're completely uh, disabled. There's not a single one, they've all been turned off. So there's ways that they can play with the, um, the threat and tension of each level by changing how difficult these are to find, um, how many enemies between you and the chamber, um, how long it's, gonna, it's, it's likely going to take the player to get to the chamber, and if the chambers are even active enough. Another thing that they can do is change the um, amount of health and energy that they gave back for the chamber. So System Shock still has a lot of RPG elements. And really it RPG in the, in the truest sense of the word. Like you are playing the role of this hacker that is just on the station and you just got to figure things out. No one's going to, it's not like Half-Life or something where you just get the weapons in sequential order and then you always have them in your inventory. You have to choose, okay, what weapons do I want to use? What weapons work best for my play style? You also get cyber augmentations. These can do anything like um, provide you sort of night vision or light. In the early game, because the controls were very sort of uh, slow, it was difficult to turn around and stuff like that, you could have a camera in the back of your head um, so that you could see if someone was coming up behind you. Um, you can have an energy shield so that you can tank more damage in combat. Uh, there's a, there's even, I think, <laughs> they have these like uh, rocket skate things, but there's certain areas of the game that can't really be um, accessed because you need a little bit of ability to sort of levitate or, or get more jump past certain platforms. So, um, and many of these things don't necessarily have to be accessed by the player. So once again, that's where sort of the role-playing elements come in because you the cyber augmentations that you have basically your player build is largely a uh, mix of okay what augmentations have you found what do you have installed what weapons are you using uh, what resources do you have um, this was also looking glasses foray into shooting mechanics there were projectile weapons in underworld but this one really had to have sort of tighter shooting because there was firearms and energy weapons and things like that um, so this game definitely uh, had sort of simulation aspects to even some of its shooting and combat controls. For example, uh, throwing grenades, you literally have to throw the grenades out of your inventory. So you select them in your inventory, it'll show it up in your hand, and you have to sort of uh, drag it across the screen, screen quickly to try and throw it at things um, using the sort of same... Uh, physics engine that was kind of in Ultima Underworld 1 and 2 to try and, you know, simulate, okay, this is how grenade throws work, things like that. Um, there are certain objects in the game, like crates and things like that, that will have uh, rudimentary physics attached to them as well. Uh, loading your gun in the game, there's no dedicated reload button, so you will actually have to physically go and press a button in your inventory to tell it, you kind of have to double click this button to say like, hey, please reload the gun. I think this was an effort to sort of simulate the stress of having to reload under pressure because you'll have enemies, you know, sort of bearing down on you in a corridor and you're having to go through your inventory and, um, you know, try and click to get the reload. Um, but, you know, in, in the sort of vein of immersive sims, there's also great things in the game like being able to select different ammo types um, for different types of enemies. 
You know, for example, armor piercing ammunition obviously does more damage against uh, cyborg, comp or cyborg opponents or robotic opponents, whereas um, and energy weapons as well, whereas you can use uh, hollow point ammunition or these needles from this needle gun to do more damage to soft targets, like uh, these mutants that are all over the station. Um, there's also sort of immersive sim puzzle solving aspects. You have to find, literally physically find the key cards and literally drag things into your inventory. Uh, you have to pick up objects in the game world, much like Ultima Underworld, and find a way to use them on different things. Um, there's also ways to sort of buff your character with different stims. You have stims for stamina, you have stims for health regeneration, you have stims for combat stims, which allow you to do a ton more damage in melee combat. So, you know, Warren Spector has sort of been on record as saying he doesn't really like numerical stats for role-playing experiences. He's always striving to find more immersive uh, or better ways to allow players to build a character without saying, oh, you have 25 strength, so that means you can pick up this, you know. He wants to have more complex systems, and I, I can definitely agree with that sentiment. So System Shock was definitely a game that I think tried to basically make a role-playing game, you know. Uh, it's, it's a lot like Ultima Underworld. You're dropped into a dungeon, you just kind of have to figure things out, but it has less of the sort of like, um, you know, Excel spreadsheet sort of stat uh, systems in it, it's more about just, okay, what are you as the player going to figure out how to do? How are you going to figure out this problem? Uh, what resources do you have at your disposal to deal with this problem? Uh, what kind of decisions are you going to make in terms of resource management and things like that? Prioritizing objectives, going off the beaten path to find more resources. So System Shock was sort of a landmark title in that it allowed us to have a sort of role-playing experience and it was the first immersive sim to sort of sort of step away from the the sort of uh, hardcore RPG elements but still provide a role-playing experience. And I'd like to say too that I think Warren Spector really does like the idea of role-playing games where it, as in games where you are getting immersed in the world and playing the role of that character, imagining that you are that character. And dice rolls and numerical stats are a a way for you to connect to the game world and its systems on a tabletop game, but as he has come out in interviews to say, it don't necessarily have a lot of merit in a video game. And so that's why I think System Shock is important as not only in immersive sim, but in RPG, to show people that actually role-playing doesn't have to be about dice rolls and numerical stats. So System Shock was an amazing title that gave us this awesome horror cyberpunk aesthetic with the addition of Shodan. Um, it was a much more methodical and complex uh, shooting game than something like Doom at the time. And way ahead of its time that spawned so many different uh, games. I think Half-Life was definitely influenced by the sort of pacing and setup and everything of, of a game like System Shock. Um, obviously, you know, any sort of sci-fi horror thing that has come out has basically ripped off System Shock. Alien Isolation, for example, is, is pretty much System Shock. Um, uh, Doom 3 really just said, like, let's just make System Shock uh, out of Doom. So it's funny that a lot of people accused uh, System Shock earlier of being a Doom clone when it was anything but, and then, of course, Doom comes around the bend and sort of rips off System Shock down the road. Another thing that sort of System Shock uh, pioneered was uh, they actually dropped all of the dialogue and NPCs and things like that from the game because they felt that it, it took you out of the experience too much, having to go into this little window to talk to people and manu so manually select your choices. And of course, as many people famously know, this is why the audio logs and diaries were born, because they needed a way to tell the story without you know, forcing the character into these sort of gaudy dialogue trees and things like that. And of course, that has been you know, rippled throughout time and has massively influenced the industry. Um, and fun little side note too is that the original Dead Space was, because EA owned the license for System Shock, the original Dead Space was actually originally being developed as System Shock 3. And for some reason, I don't know, maybe EA did some group uh, demographic 
uh, focus groups or something like that and determined uh, nobody really knows what System Shock is anymore and you know things like this and so I, I don't remember exactly why but they changed it they're like let's make a new IP and so they made Dead Space so um, there's actually a couple of areas in the original Dead Space one of them for example is a basketball court which I always felt like wow this is exactly like where that radio transmitter is in System Shock 2 and I think it was a direct homage to System Shock 2 because it was originally a System Shock game so even franchises like Dead Space, you know, owe their their um, lineage directly to games like System Shock. So, and this was one of the games that sort of put Looking Glass on the map again, um, and really started to establish them as a studio that really kicked ass technologically and also pushed the limits of game design into new frontiers. Next, we have The Elder Scrolls II: Daggerfall. Um, this is a game, um, I'm going to pro probably include a link in the description, uh, Razor Fist did an excellent bit of coverage on this game, uh, I think Lazy Game Reviews as well did some excellent coverage on this game. This is one of the biggest game worlds ever made. This is a game where you can, I believe you can be a pirate and have a pirate ship. I think someone mapped out the entire square, uh, mileage or square, uh, kilometers of the game world to find the surface area and I think they said it's something like the size of South Carolina or something like that like in reality it's like hundreds of square miles if not thousands of square miles so this is an enormous game world with an amazing amount of breadth and depth of possibilities you can have this was you know like for example you look at Skyrim now and when players were like, well, we want to have a house, they were like, well, you got that house in Whiterun. It's like, yeah, it's kind of lame. It's like a little cottage. What else you got? So they came out with the Hearthfire DLC. And that was pretty lame, you know, because you could only select from a handful of houses and you could only put in a handful of prearranged assets in them. You, you didn't have a lot of choice. You had some choice, but not a lot. And it was sort of disappointing. And... Um, of course, this game lets you have houses on prearranged assets and stuff like that too, but uh, just this was back in the day, I mean, but the basically you can have houses and I think almost every single major town in the game, uh, you can uh, have all sorts of different conveyance, I think you can have carts, you can have ships, you can have um, horses, you can ride whatever, you can... Uh, you can become not just a werewolf, but a vampire, and I think like a werehog or something like that, like a were-boar. Um, there are a dizzying amount of factions that you can join and do quests for and things like that. It was really attempting to be just like, here's the world of Tamriel, just live in it. And you can live in it, and you can live in it for years, quite literally, because it is so big, it is it is hard to imagine being able to completely finish most of the content in the game. And then once you've finished it, you can just sort of roleplay and live in the world. So I think, once again, it really tried to strive for those immersive sim principles of being an incredibly immersive experience, a simulation of a world. I believe the world has day-night cycles, it's got weather, and just trying to simulate a world that big, I think, is, is a really monumental achievement. Now, I, I have heard a lot of it procedurally generated, and not all of the map has a ton of depth because it's so freaking big, but just the fact that a game world of this size, and of course there's tons of depth in how you want to play the game, customizing your character, what kind of things you do, what kind of factions you join, and you can really just roleplay and basically live whatever kind of life you want to live in the world of Tamriel, and that's something that, you know... This level of role playing and this level of immersion and, and simulation is just not really seen in anymore in things like Skyrim. One thing that has bugged me so much about games like Skyrim is you, know, you can sit there and drink 46 bottles of mead, but you don't get drunk. You'll get like a minus one to intelligence. So that's not simulation. That's not immersive. You know, uh, I, I much prefer games like maybe Red Dead Redemption 2 where you know, your character will actually start to get gaunt and you'll start to lose like tons of stamina and things like that if you don't go in and eat. But when you eat, you actually physically see your character sit down and eat the meal and everything like that. Um, and I believe, I don't think you can make Arthur fat, but I believe you can get him to be a little bit chunkier um, the more you eat and stuff like that. You can get drunk and actually like 
get wasted and then he like it's diff you know he's he's wobbling and his vision's blurry and stuff like that then you'll wake up with a hangover um, and you have to deal with your hangover and so it's just that adds to in my opinion immersion it allows you to really live out the life and simulate being in this world and modern elder scrolls games have really strayed away from doing this but games like daggerfall were all about maybe not things like that but they were all about like let's make this world as believable as possible and make the player feel like they are in it and they're living there and give them limitless possibilities as they would in a real world so Daggerfall 2 is definitely a must play. I personally haven't played it yet. Unfortunately, I just started my Unity playthrough and I'm kind of getting a feel for the game, but I have definitely boned up on it. I have seen many videos of it and I would strongly encourage you to check out channels like Razorfist who've covered Daggerfall and have done live streams of it. Um, Lazy Game Reviews, LGR have, have done has done a great video on uh, Daggerfall. So if you're interested in it, go check it out. Uh, the Unity version is incredible. It seems to run fantastically. Uh, it's very easy. It's a great update. Um, it looks great. It runs great. It runs in whatever resolution you want. And as far as I can tell, it seems to be fairly bug free, but we'll see. So yeah. Thief the Dark Project, back to Looking Glass Studios. This is one of my, this particular game is not my favorite game of all time, but it's one of my favorite, or it possibly my favorite series of all time. And it all started with Thief the Dark Project. And I think one of the landmark contributions to immersive sims that I think largely gets overlooked from Thief the Dark Project and the Thief series in general is it showed that, once again, back to sort of Warren Spector's sort of design philosophy, like, we don't need stats, we don't need magic, we don't need, you know, RPG elements with leveling up and things like that to make an immersive sim. To make a role-playing experience or an immersive experience, you don't need those things. And once again, Thief really demonstrated this wholeheartedly. There is no leveling up in Thief. There is no experience points. There are no stats. There's no player build at the beginning of the game. There's no upgrade trees. There's nothing like that, okay? Much like System Shock, Thief is really about dropping the player into, instead of one large sort of open world, like in System Shock or Underworld, Thief is about dropping the player into a mission and saying, you need to steal this and that's pretty much all the information they give you. Sometimes they'll give you a map with a few clues on it, and that's it. So what you have at your disposal is tools, game systems, and your wits. And that's what an immersive sim is about. Um, some of the most non-linear level design you will ever see in a game, it's fantastic. Each mission is essentially its own little open world with tons of ways in and out of mansions, tons and ways in and out of different rooms, secret doors. One of the, the most impressive immersive sim aspects that they added to this game, so much like Underworld and System Shock, they have things like simulated physics, uh, simulated lighting engine, where you can actually change um, lighting once again in the environment. Um, and uh, one of the things, that, one of the bigger things that they added, I think, was the rope arrows. The rope arrows allow you to access verticality in the level not wherever you want to but virtually wherever you want to and it adds a whole other element to traversal puzzles and allows you to you know for example you could try and go in through the front door and then have to do some real heavy sneaking and be really careful or you could just shoot a rope arrow into the rafters above the balcony and then just climb up and uh, go into the mansion or go into the castle through there so Again, adding all of the, these simulation aspects, you know, okay, we want the rope arrows, so we simulate physics, we simulate the rope physics, we allow the player to, to shoot them um, on, so, it, you know, if you compare it to like Thief 2014, for example, you can only shoot rope arrows at these specific beams, which means there are only specific spots in the city that you can climb up to. You could make the same argument for Thief the Dark Project, you can only climb in certain spots, but it's anything that is wood which means that it opens up a much wider array of possibilities for places that you can climb up to. And as 
you know, one of the adages of, or, or one of the goals of, of immersive sims is, you know, sort of emergent gameplay. Um, this idea that the player will, will uh, figure out ways to play the game that even the developers hadn't thought of, adding things like rope arrows in and then just applying a global rule, like, okay, anything would you can um, sink a rope arrow into, uh, is a great way for a player to express themselves. I have a great story about Thief. This is actually for Thief 2, but it's, it's a great story. So I saw a ledge that was kind of like... It was kind of like um, on top of this wall where like guards would patrol, and I figured there was some cool loot up there, and I couldn't find a way to get up there. Now, Thief does fi uh, simulate physics, and it has physics objects like you can throw plates and bowls and things like that, um, and crates. And so, first thing I did, you know, simplest solution, I tried to stack some crates to get up there. Well, Thief has a physics system. It's not a great physics system. It works for the things that it needs to, like arrows and throwing distractions. It is not super great at stacking things. So stacking boxes in Thief is kind of a nightmare, and it just it wasn't working out really well. So what did I do? I said, well, hold on. These crates are made out of wood, and I have a rope arrow. So I threw the crate on top of the wall, right? And then I shot it with the rope arrow, and it worked. Uh, the story has a, a sad ending, though, because I wasn't able to actually climb up the rope. And here's why. Um, physics and simulation. So because it's a, a simulation, and it wasn't like a puzzle where it's like if you put like a like a skate from Monkey Island or something, if you put the box here and then you use rope arrow on it, you can climb up. No, well, uh, the the, ro or the arrow has a calculated mass and velocity in the world, uh, so it transferred its momentum into the box when I shot it, and it pushed the box away. <laughs> so while it worked, because I eventually did get up there, I think I, I did en end up stacking the boxes and just kind of, you know, I just, with spit and prayer, just finally made it up there. And I got up there, and yeah, for sure, the rope had gone into the crate, and it had dropped a rope. Um, another thing that's great about Thief in terms of like being an immersive simulation that you wouldn't see in like another stealth game, for example, is that that, that isn't trying to be an immersive simulation is that uh, all of the arrows, again, are physics objects, so they have mass velocity and, and will transfer momentum to certain objects, but also that they, because they are physics objects in the world, you can recover all the arrows. And it's not a scripted thing either, where it's just like, okay, if you shoot a guy with the arrow... You go loot his body, it shows one in his inventory. No, it just literally stays in his body, and then you go up and you yank it out. You know, or it's in a door and you yank it out. If you shoot them at certain surfaces, they break sometimes. So, you know, you can't recover every single arrow in the game. But it is cool that if you're shooting, and especially with rope arrows. So one of the things the game will do is they'll only give you, like, two rope arrows. And this is your, and to encourage you to be like, hey, you know, Manage your resources. Pick pick up after yourself. After you're done using the rope arrow, grab it out of the ceiling so you can use it again. Um, so Thief really shines as an immersive simulation by giving you a lot of tools and having a lot of... Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good simulation for what it wants to do. Like I said, uh, it's got a light system. So you can change... Uh, local lighting in the environment with things like water arrows or turning off light switches because it's sort of steampunk so there's electricity and electrical lights and things like that so you can actually turn off lights or you can extinguish torches and things like that and because the game also simulates okay how you know it has a, it has variables and things that it calculates for how visible Garrett is based on the rel relative amount of light he's in um, creating shadows helps you hide from your enemies and also the fact that you have some idea as a character how visible you are helps you get a more immersed in the experience because it, it emboldens you to be able to say okay I am hidden now I am not going to be found unless I make a ton of noise and that gets into the next sort of layer of simulation in Thief is that it has a very robust sound propagation engine probably one of the most sophisticated ever put into a game and has never really been rivaled since you can tell where uh, enemies are based on the, the the sounds that they're making in the environment and it's very easy to track with your ears because it's a highly accurate sound propagation system it also takes into account things like 
you know, uh, the material. So like, you know, stone corridors will transfer sound differently than a, a hallway that's all wood or something like that. And basically what this allows you to do is without having a map that shows all of the enemy's locations on it, a la like Hitman or uh, Metal Gear Solid or something like that, what you have is the ability to listen and say, hmm, okay, that guy's upstairs, that guy's way down the hall. This guy's approaching pretty rapidly, actually. Um, I think even uh, you can lean your ear against doors and it will actually amplify what you can hear into the next room. So actually, doors being closed totally change how sound propagates through the environment. And if you want to listen in um, to see if a guard is approaching or, or leaving uh, in a hallway, but you don't want to open the door, you can lean your ear against it and actually determine where he is that way. And then the sound works both ways in Thief 2. You know, they simulate the character making noise as well. So you can't move too fast. Um, you don't want to jump, you don't want to drop objects, uh, you don't want to shoot arrows because all of these things will create sound that will attract people. Um, and also different surfaces are going to transmit sound in a different way. As, w as someone pointed out, you know, typically in a game, you know, if they want to increase the difficulty, they'll increase the amount of enemies or they'll increase, you know, the amount of damage enemies do to you. In a game like Thief, uh, I think a good boss fight for a game like Thief they actually have a good boss fight in the Dark Project, but a good boss fight for a game like Thief would be a totally illuminated room that's just completely floored with tile because that is probably the toughest situation you could ever be in in a game like Thief. You make tons of noise on the tile and light is your enemy. Um, the game draws in shadows and, and shading and things like that and actually the way you play the game is to follow the patches of shadow and dark on the floor to be able to stay hidden. Um, so one of the things I really love about Thief is it's just not, it, not only is it an amazing concept for a game, like you are a thief, be stealthy, get in, steal shit, get out, try not to kill too many people, or try not to be seen at all, you know. Um, it's a great premise, it's a great world, it's probably one of my favorite game worlds or fictional worlds ever. Um, this mix of like steampunk, sort of Victorian steampunk technology with like, you know, medieval era Europe like castles and knights and chainmail and swords and shit and um, it's just you know like dark fantasy and steampunk and all of this stuff it's great uh, but I think I also really like it because it shows there's a lot of people who are into immersive sims and they're like well basically immersive sims are just first person shooter RPG hybrids and I think that's a very lame definition because it, it completely misses the design philosophy and the point of immersive sims. And I think uh, Thief is a great example of how it's like, eh, it doesn't have RPG elements. You know, uh, like, as we... Here's, I don't, I don't like the term RPG elements because you know, role-playing should just be about like, okay, I'm playing the role of this person. I've definitely gotten immersed and felt like I'm role-playing as Garrett in Thief. Um, uh, Stat-based progression system... So it doesn't have stat-based progression system in the game. Um, it doesn't have player builds. It doesn't have upgrade trees. And yet it is still a great immersive sim because they basically just, like I said, make this highly simulated world and they add a lot of immersive elements. If you want to recover health, you can pick up food and eat it. Um, there are plenty of physics objects in the world that don't have, you know, when I was a kid first playing Thief, I was just like, why can't I pick up all these plates? Like, what, are they for puzzles? Like, no, they're just because they're, they're just loose objects in the world that you could pick up in reality anyways. And one thing that you can do with them is actually, this doesn't always work super well, because not everything in the game is perfect, it's an old game, um, but you theoretically can throw them to create distractions. Um, you get things like noisemaker arrows, which will create a ton of noise to lure guards. You can also just use a broadhead arrow because once again, sound propagation system, you don't have to use noisemaker arrows to make noise with arrows. So again, the simulation sort of making certain game systems redundant, but I'd rather have something like that than where it's like, no, shooting a broadhead won't do anything. Even though it's clearly making noise, it won't distract them because they're, they're scripted to only go for noisemakers. No, they're scripted to go for noise in general. And that's where the simulation aspect comes in. Um, but yeah, theoretically, you can throw them to create noise as well uh, to distract people. Um, and the other thing Thief does is give you a lot of tools 
to help you with this sort of immersive simulation to help you problem solve. Like I said, rope arrows, fire arrows can be used to uh, blast open locked doors. Much like Ultima Underworld, a lot of doors in the game can be opened with either blasting them open with fire arrows or um, beating them open with your sword. It is not a recommended way of opening doors because you're a thief, you're probably gonna wanna steal a key or lock pick it, but you can if you want to. Um, gas arrows allow you to instantly drop an enemy. Um, the scouting orbs that show up in Thief 2 allow you to spot around corners and things like that. Uh, flash bombs allow you to uh, cause enemies to stop while they're in pursuit of you, which allows you to get away. Um, and then it's harder for them to find you. Although, I gotta be honest, I don't typically use a lot of flash bombs in Thief. Um, I don't know why. I should, they should probably get into that more. And... Uh, moss arrows. Moss arrows are a great, you know, so it's like, okay, the, the, the game introduces, like, okay, walking on certain surfaces makes too much noise, and it's really tough to get around enemies, so here's a tool that allows you to change the way that sound interacts with the floor in front of you. You shoot an arrow that just starts spawning tons of moss patches all over the floor. It makes your steps uh, super quiet so you can sneak up on people. So, again, you know, um, but it, it, the game also has a, a large level of resource management, and I really like some of the systems in the game. You know, like, you don't just get the equipment at the beginning of the mission. Garrett has a small stockpile of equipment that he keeps at home, but if you want anything else, you gotta buy it. How do you buy it? Uh, well, you have to use the money in the game that you've accrued from stealing shit. So, I like how, once again, sort of that simulation aspect, your equipment's not free in this world. It's sort of immersive to be like, yeah, you gotta buy your own gear. And it also heavily encourages the player to play more like a thief and less like a spy or just someone who needs to rush to the objective because it behooves you for the next level to steal as much as you possibly can because the difficulty of the levels only keeps getting better or, or more and more as time goes on. So Thief the Dark Project, one of the most influential of titles of all time one of the best games series of all time i i have my issues with the first thief i don't think it's a bad game at all i just for perspective's sake i've played thief 2 maybe 12 to 15 times in my entire life thief 3 maybe 10 times and uh thief the dark project maybe three two or three so i mean that just kind of shows you like it's not my favorite in the series moving on system shock 2 so Remember how I said Warren Spector was like, yeah, you know, I'd like to move away from stat-based, you know, role-playing elements. Um, if I can, I think there's more sophisticated ways to uh, have this more sophisticated ways to allow the player expression and role-playing in a game world. Uh, well, System Shock 2 definitely doesn't embrace that design philosophy and i think system shock 2 was one of the first instances that we start to see where immersive sims really start to become more about trying to merge sort of deep role-playing elements with uh sort of first person gameplay or first person shooting in addition to the fact that um system shock 2 like I said, I don't really like the definition of immersive sims being games where you can solve problems in a lot of different ways and be creative. I think that is, um, I think it's a result of the design philosophy of immersive sims. I don't think it is the foundation or the design philosophy of immersive sims. I don't think they go in saying, like I said before, you need to solve this problem in a number of different ways. I think they go in saying, like, let's just, you know, give the player a ton of freedom. Um, so System Shock was the beginning of sort of drifting into that that other territory. But System Shock 2, I, I mean System Shock 2, System Shock 2 is an amazing game. Um, I think it is, it takes the character of Shodan and, and just amplifies it to 11. And it's got an, I, I really like the story and the feel of the game. And I like how System Shock 1 was definitely steeped in that sort of grungy, sort of 90s sci-fi look. You know, you see that same kind of look in, in games like StarCraft and, you know, games of the time. And System Shock 2 is kind of interesting. Um, if you actually look at the game, it kind of looks like 
Um, what if something really horrific happened in TNG? Because the spaceship actually looks kind of nice, and it's got a lot of, like, uh, the colors, like, from the 90s, like, turquoise and purple, and there's, like, carpeted hallways, like, on the Enterprise in, in Star Trek The Next Generation and things like that. But it's like, okay, what if something really horrific happened here? You know, so one of the things I like about System Shock 2 is this sort of juxtaposition of, you know, this sort of... Uh, brightest age of humanity looking starship uh, like from Star Trek uh, set against you know unspeakable horror uh, all this body horror and things like that um, the general setup is that this is way after the events of System Shock 1 so in System Shock 1 the the AI goes rogue and just kind of takes over the station and starts you know first she wants to wipe out mankind by blowing up the earth with this laser and then secondly she wants to um, uh, create all these like you know biological experiments and mutants and stuff like that and she wants to essentially become a god uh well you blow her up and you blow up the station but i think one thing that was clever was there's one point in the system shock one where you jettison uh these sort of like biospheres that are attached to citadel with all this uh there's like parks inside and plant life and they produce oxygen and stuff and she has released like a ton of her mutants in there and this mutagenic virus to see what it'll do and you jettison those into space. Well, this takes place 40-something years later after System Shock 1, and you are on the first faster-than-light ship ever made. You are just a sort of space marine. And you wake up, and everything has gone to shit on the ship, and you don't really know why. So you're, you're led by this woman um, who tells you to... Uh, you know, basically, you need to survive, and then you need to help us deal with the infestation. So there's this sort of parasitic life form that they found on this planet, and it has taken over the ship and most of the crew. And there are these worm-like creatures that, you know, infest your body, and then eventually they sort of grow and mutate and get bigger, and then they take complete control of you, and then, you know, you spawn these, like, weird egg clutches and all this stuff. And then eventually you add your biomass to this large sort of tumor-like growth on one of the ships. So really great sort of body horror and stuff like that. And you find out later in the game, this is somewhat spoilers, so I'm going to give you a second here if you don't want to hear it. So you find out later in the game that uh, this is a heavily mutated version of the biological experiments that Shodan was conducting on the uh, biosphere module that you launched into space in the first game. And they just happened to come across it and find it there. Additionally, what they found, because you destroyed Shodan, was she actually backed up a copy of herself into the computer systems of the biodome that you sent out into space. So, of course, now Shodan has infested the system. One of the things I like about System Shock 2 is Shodan is sort of an uneasy ally with you for most of the game because uh, the infestation has, and, and the, they're called the many, they've gotten out of control. And she's worried about her own survival now. Um, so she enlists the help of the player eventually to help her deal with the many infestation. But, you know, she's not to be trusted either. So uh, System Shock 2 adds in, whereas the original game didn't have any stat-based role-playing elements or anything like that, System Shock 2 has deep role-playing elements. You have to roll for your character stats. You have to pick a specialization. Um, you have to pick your skills and attributes and stuff like that. And... Um, it's also very, like, if you've ever played a sort of really complex RPG, a lot of, you know, how useful these attributes and skills are going to be at some point in the game are, are, are very vague, you know. And you can choose from three uh, basic classes. You have your uh, marine, which is, you know, specializes in weapons and things like that. You have an engineer, which specializes in things like repair, uh, but more importantly, into hacking systems on the ship, like security cameras and things like that. And then, of course, you have uh, the OSA. And so, much like how Ultima Underworld was like, well, you can be a fighter, you can be a mage, you can be whatever, um, this was sort of the first immersive sim to bring about the idea of having sort of magic-like RPG elements um, in a first-person shooter. And so you have uh, the OSA build, which uses... Um, psychic powers uh and you get this psychic amplifier and it lets you do all sorts of crazy things um so on the surface it's, it's things like you know damaging enemies with uh, blasts of 
frost for some reason, then eventually you can get pyrokinesis where you shoot fireballs at people and things like that. But um, it also allows you to do a ton of other stuff. You know, it's a lot like the magic system from Ultima Underworld. You know, for example, in Ultima Underworld, if you don't have lockpicking, um, if you can't bash the door down, and if you're too lazy to find the key, well, you can just use a spell, and I think it opens up, except for the final door at the end of the game, it opens up every single door in the game. <laughs> you can use it, you can cast a spell to unlock doors. And... So that game allows you to use the magic system to basically circumnavigate a bunch of the game's mechanics, but in a clever way, you know, instead of having to barter for food or find food, you can just spawn food in Ultima Underworld with the spells. You can just heal with the spells. Um, I think you can, there's even one to upgrade your, your charm or something like that temporarily so you can get better uh, bartering prices or things like that. Um, you can uh, convince enemies to stop attacking you with certain spells, you know, all sorts of things like that. So System Shock 2 really uh, uses the Psy system to circumnavigate a lot of stuff. Like, so for example, um, hacking. You can uh, invest into a Psy ability that allows you to temporarily increase your hacking level. Um, this means that you don't have to spend skill points on the actual hacking ability, which is more expensive than the Psy power to up your hacking skill. Um, if you aren't very good at using weapons or anything like that, you can invest in a Psy ability to temporarily increase the amount of melee damage you can do so that you don't have to actually pick up guns or, or, or other kind of weapons, you can just use melee. Um, you can, uh, set up a, um, a field of fire, like this sort of, like, uh, yeah, this sort of like uh, wreath of fire around yourself so that you're constantly doing en damage to enemies that are in close proximity to you and then if they try and hit you, you're doing even more damage to them. Um, so there's a lot of things like that you can do with the Psy ability. You can turn completely invisible so you can just completely um, run past certain encounters in the game. Um, of course, you have the offensive abilities like uh, pyrokinesis and stuff like that. You can use telekinesis, so like if there's items that you can't reach because your agility or your jump skills are not high enough, you can just pull them towards you. So it really gives a lot of depth to the game. And the other thing I really like about System Shock is you can't... You pick a class, you know, basically mage, fighter, or... I don't know, tinkerer or whatever, smith... Uh, you pick a class, but you can't just stick with one. So, for example, if you're a uh, marine class, well, you're going to want hack and you're going to want repair. And the reason is is because it's a, it's got sort of survival horror aspects to it. So resources are rare and you're not going to have access to a ton of ammo all the time. So you're going to want to be able to hack so that you don't have to spend as much at uh, vending machines on getting more ammo. Um, and you're also going to want repair because there's weapon degradation in the game. So you're going to need to be able to keep your guns in working order or they're going to be useless. And you don't have a lot of other skills, so if you're relying only on your weapons, you're kind of screwed if they start breaking. Uh, if you're an engineer, yeah, you can hack security cameras so that you don't have to fight as much. You can hack turrets so that they'll fight for you. Um, and you can repair weapons, but you're probably pretty terrible at sh using the weapons, which means weapon spread's going to be all over the place. They'll uh, degrade a lot more quickly um, and things like that. So you're going to maybe want to invest in your weapon abilities, or you're going to want maybe some Psy abilities to sort of augment yourself. And if you're pure Psy, once again, you're going to want um, maybe some hacking abilities or uh, maybe some weapon abilities, because the final boss of the game, for example, cannot be killed with just Psy powers. You have to have something that does physical damage. Um, so having a gun can be nice, and so you're gonna have to find this sort of middle of the road, well, not really middle of the road, but you need to stick with your class, but you need to uh, intelligently seek out, okay, what skills are gonna be important for my playthrough and, and use them accordingly. But of course the addition of the, um, all of the different side powers gives the game a lot of depth, and even though it's not a traditional sort of setup for immersive sims where you have like, okay, here's a problem, how do I get around it this way? Um, it, it doesn't really feel like that in the same way. Uh, once you get the Psy abilities, it does become more like that because you can do things like stun security cameras and then go up and hack them really quick. You can do things like take them over uh, temporarily from a distance. You can do things like 
temporarily upgrade your uh, hack ability so that you can get into this terminal to get something that you need you can uh, be invisible if you're just running low on resources like health and ammo or, or even psi hypos you can um, you can turn invisible and just try and run past certain areas so it's it is a really great experience um, and it has a lot of sort of immersive sim elements I love the fact that much like in the original system shock you have an inventory that has to be managed and it's the best kind of inventory in my opinion which is that grid based inventory which assigns different number of spaces to objects based on their size and or weight um, you know you've got the upgrade trees I also like the fact that you're technically the user interface is really it's sort of like a thing that comes up in your eyes because you have all these cybernetic implants so it's supposed to be a thing that comes up in your eyes a little uh, gooey interface that that um, pops up in your in your eyeball and so the game doesn't pause when you open up the menu so if you need to manage your inventory or or read an email or um, check your objective list or something like that it's happening all in real time and you bring it up um, uh, with this little interface um, that you see and it's supposed to sort of simulate, okay, like, all right, well, you know, this isn't a video game. You can't just pause it to check your email or something. And the world doesn't stop because you're, you're, uh, you're looking at what you have in your inventory or something like that. Um, the other thing that I would say about System Shock 2 is in terms of a gameplay feel, um, if you were to move from, like, here's a good example. If you were to move from something like uh, Doom to... Doom 2016 or Doom Eternal, it is that big of a leap in technology and gameplay from System Shock 1 to 2. You went from a game that did have a 3D mapped world, but uh, very sort of pixelated, uh, low color depth textures, and used sprite based enemies, to now everything is fully 3D modeled with colored lighting and, and complex lighting because it's the dark engine. and and more advanced physics and more advanced sound propagation and also it has learned some things from shooters since the original System Shock came out which didn't have mouse look you know System Shock 2 now has mouse look and um, it just feels way better and certain things that were kind of neat elements in the original System Shock but um, not super critical uh, were, were sort of left out like not having a dedicated reload button so now there's a dedicated reload button um, but they kept in things like having to uh, quickly press tab to manage your inventory and, and physically manage your inventory and stuff like that. You have to physically change in the, in the little inventory menu uh, the ammo type. So basically if you're in the middle of combat you have to switch to your interface real quick. Um, go change your ammo type like let's say you're fighting a robot now. Okay I gotta go change over to armor piercing and then go back. So honestly because I played them back to back one summer and I really felt like wow this still feels like System Shock 1 in many many ways except for the fact that it is updated so it's it would be like if you played um, first time ever played Doom and you're like wow this is amazing and you hadn't really played that many shooters and then like the next one you played is Doom 2016 you're like wow this is a major advancement the first one's still amazing and this is an advancement it's an improvement on many things and it's different in certain ways but it's an advancement so it really felt like this technological leap forward. So I can imagine it being kind of like, if you are a huge System Shock fan, being sort of a big deal sequel, um, because it just added so much to the game. Um, and then the addition of role-playing elements, too, adds a lot of sort of depth and customization to the game um, that wasn't necessarily present, and I don't think necessarily necessary, <laughs> necessarily necessary, in the, in the original System Shock. Um, and of course it does have that immersive sim aspect to it. Oh, there are a lot of simulated systems in the game, you know, because it's running from the dark engine, sound, physics, things like that. Um, and the fact that you, there is a pause menu, but in terms of the game world, you can't pause. You can recover health by eating food items and things like that. You have to physically manage your inventory. So it really, yeah, once again, it's trying to create sort of a simulation. I think it's, it's not as sort of, in keeping with the original design philosophy of immersive sims as some of their previous titles but it's not like it's not compared to other games it absolutely is um and it was definitely doing it sort of its own thing uh but it's an amazing game absolutely one of the best games of all time um and a worthy addition to the genre of immer or, or family of immersive sims and it was one of looking glasses last games this was their last game though thief to the metal age Thief 2, I mean, I'm not going to...
be super redundant about a lot of the things that I said about Thief 1, but Thief 2 is my favorite Thief game. Uh, one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, and basically, Thief set up the systemic approach, it set up the immersive simulation, and it set up the world of Thief, and Thief 2 delivered on the level design. One of the big complaints about Thief 1, and a lot of people try to poo-poo these complaints now, but they're, in my opinion, they are absolutely valid complaints, is that in Thief 1, there is too much of an emphasis on a lot of enemies that are A, difficult to sneak around, and B, more sort of combative enemies. They're not guards, like in a castle. They are zombies, you know, and dinosaurs and things like that. So it's it's kind of difficult to not engage in combat with them sometimes, you know. they they're, they're pathing through the environment is more random. Um, they are they at least for me seem to be harder to hide from they seem to be more sensitive to uh, sound and stuff like that and they're often put in a lot of places where there's a lot of illumination and not a lot of places to hide because they think they wanted this sort of tense encounter with a lot of the uh, zombies in the game where you feel like okay like i gotta be quiet but i also gotta get around this quickly um a lot of monsters and things like that whereas thief 2 was and and most of the missions you know, sort of ended up being less about stealing stuff and more about, like, just sort of navigating the environment and just trying to get to the end of, like, a tomb or a dungeon or something like that. Thief 2 really is more like sort of a heist game, right? They just drop you into these large open levels and they say, like, you need to steal this or you need to, you know, um, find out about this, get some information about this, and then you go. And in addition to that, that I mean, there's the level design in terms of its complexity, its beauty, it's the kind of game that you can play over and over and over and over again and still find new, like, secret areas. You're like, I had no idea this was here, you know? And still find notes that you hadn't read before and being like, yeah, I had no idea that, that there was this, like, little subplot or anything like that. Like, there's one great one in Thief 2 where this guy uh, is, he notices another planet, and so he tells his uh, manservant, okay, uh, I'm gonna load up um, this tube with a bunch of explosives and try and launch myself at the planet and then uh, you need you to look at the telescope and I'll start flagging over to you uh, to tell you that I've made it and I think he ends up just blowing himself up but little great you know bits of story uh, and things that you'll find like that so there's just a ton of detail all of the immersive sim aspects from Thief uh, 1 return uh, and they add in a few more things to the game um, they add in things like gas mines, so you can put mines down now, uh, explosive mines, because there are robotic tank-like enemies in the game. Um, and I love that they're steam-powered, so you can actually shoot a water arrow. I mean, you could try and blow them up with fire arrows or explosives and make all this noise, or you can go with a more stealthy approach, which is to either A, avoid them entirely, or B, shoot a water arrow into their boiler uh, to... to